Okay, so uh, lab week two, we're going to talk a little about systematics and taxonomy. And Chris and Alexis are here, and we're Hi. all just going to pitch in. So uh, we thought it was important to learn something about the systematics so you get a better appreciation of how people figure out who's related to whom. Um, and so let's start with the levels of the classification classification scheme, you know, when you go all the way from chordates to class aves, so we're in the class aves birds this course, right? And anyway, we get down to um, orders and families, those are the key levels that we're going to talk about in this class. And the orders end in I-F-O-R-M-E-S, if formies, and families end in I-D-A-E, -E -D. I was told, yep. pronounced a D instead of a day, but you know, you can do what you want. Uh, <laughs> then everyone knows genus always begins with capital letter. The specific epithet, the species, never begins with a capital, even if it's Americana or something. So that's that's simple stuff. Now let's get into oh, still simple stuff. You had this in lecture. <laughs> you had Ernst Mayer's biological species concept, where if you can interbreed, um, that's a species, and versus the phylogenetic species concept, where the uh, smallest group of organisms that share a derived character uh, constitute a species groups of organisms share a character, that's a monophyletic, they come from one line, mono, um, and, and then they split, and they share a character because they came off that one line, that's monophyly. And you're not testing whether they're related because they get reproduced with one another or not. So that's something that you can test really easily in a lab. You don't necessarily have to go out and watch individuals mate. Um, which right. is kind of nice. Right. So that's why it's in practice with what we do. Um, mm -hmm. So a couple of terms, um, just so you know that when people get into phylogenetics, these things get bandied about, so we may as well understand what they are. So parsimony, you'll hear that once in a while. So the simplest explanation is usually the right one, not get mm -hmm. too complicated. Um, that's kind of the idea. Well, yeah, so it comes into the issue when we think about birds and bats, both have wings, and so the most parsimonious answer would be that they're closely related because they both have wings and they both fly. But we know that that's not true at all, considering bats are mammals and birds are not mammals. Repeat, <laughs> birds are not mammals. <laughs> <laughs> bats aren't birds. And bats aren't birds. Uh, a cladogram is just a tree, a branching diagram representing how things are related. Here's one here. We'll get to that in a minute. but. Um, a character, anything you want to talk about that evolved, that uh, could be shared uh, uh, between you know two groups. So these would be traits like feathers or a behavior, or a, you know the way your intestines circles or whatever. Um, a character state is the state you're in for that particular character. So oh, it's a you know it's a feather that's elongated, or it's a feather that's a down feather, or it's a behavior that's you know, a polygonous mating system or whatever. Um, derived character, we talked about that in class, any character uh, that differs from the ancestral form. So if you see an ancestor that doesn't have the character, but, but the species you're looking at has it, that's a derived character. A clade, clade is a, uh, any line along that tree. Mm -hmm. Which forms a monophyletic group, so a group that contains all of the individuals in it, but not individuals outside of it. So, so on our tree so if here, we looked at that tree. a monophyletic group could be just A and B, because, can I point? Mm -hmm, sure. Right here, you'd have a most recent common ancestor, and from that ancestor, we have individual A, and in, or species A, and species B, or group A and B, whatever you want. Um, but a monophyletic group could also be this whole group, so A, B, and C, because from here on out, we would, one line. there's Mono. one line. So this entire tree that we're looking at could technically be a monophyletic group because A through F all share a most recent common ancestor here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then we only had one other thing. What was it? Synapomorphy, a shared derived trait. Okay, well, any of the traits that are shared and they're derived are synapomorphies. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we got got to our tree, so you pretty well covered that, and a common, a recent common ancestor has to be common to everyone on the list. Mm -hmm. So 
so what's, it, yeah. It's really important to stress that um, all phylogenetic trees are pretty much hypotheses of how individuals are related. Um, they're based off our best guesses, which back in the day was based just on looking at morphology, and now it's using genetic tools. So our best guesses are getting better all the time, but they're still just guesses. So these are kind of hypotheses, but they're mm -hmm. probably pretty darn close. Well-supported hypotheses. Well-supported <laughs> hypotheses when we get down to the genetics. Um, so here's an example of our tree where um, we've gone from hypothetical to looking a little bit at how birds evolve. So if we think about a most recent common ancestor being reptilian, um, so you see reptiles at the base of our tree, and then we have a derived character, feathers show up. So that's a new character that the most recent common ancestor did not have. And so um, somebody got that feather, and that's somebody mm -hmm. that was ended up being the ancestor to birds. Right. Um, so, so that's then, a derived character, mm -hmm. right? Shared by everyone in A, B, and C, but not D, E, or F, or G. I miss that. Uh, <laughs> how come F and G are mixed? <laughs> anyway, okay. A, B, C are a monophyletic group, which you said mm -hmm. before, right? And then, because the feathers are at the base there. Um, so when you want to assess how related two things are, in the old days you were looking at museum specimens and things using morphological characters. Um, and so what are you going to pick to decide if two things are related? Color? Why or why not? You know, that's one of the big questions. Mm -hmm. And so you identify traits as being either conservative or plastic. If they're conservative, what does that mean? It means it's unlikely to be to be molded easily by natural selection. Um, I think it, so. If you uh, tend to be less variable, less variable, uh, less sensitive to mm -hmm. environmental influences, uh, things like bill size, foot length, foot shape, color are are more variable and and susceptible to change just due to environmental variation. So it's not likely to reflect who you're related to if you have the same color with somebody else, for example. But if you have a certain kind of nerve structure that innervates the muscle a certain way, well, why would that be so sensitive mm -hmm. to natural selection? It's probably conservative and therefore probably reflects who you're related to. And so people that did this in the past with morphology tried to deal with conservative derived characters, characters that were not susceptible to being influenced by the environment so much. But now, biochemical methods are available, um, and it's we're getting right down to the nitty gritty of you know what the genetics say in terms of who's related to whom. So that seems to be um, the truth these days. Like in the 1970s, Sibley and Alquist did this DNA DNA hybridization technique to try to see who is related to whom, you know, in terms of the genetics, and. They basically say, gee, you got DNA for species one, DNA for species two. Uh, you put them in a pot and heat up the DNA and it melts. <laughs> it gets to a melting point where they, the DNA splits apart, right? So now you have single-stranded DNAs floating around in a bucket. And then um, you mix it up like in a bar and you let it cool. <laughs> down and the DNAs begin to come back together again and some of them will hybridize, some of the A's will hybridize with B because they're pretty similar, um, but not perfectly similar because they're different species. Anyway, how similar they are is reflected in uh, when you try to melt them again and if they, it takes just as much heat to melt them as it did before, then they're pretty much the same species. If, if they come apart really easily, they're really different genetically and the melting point would be a lot lower. So see this graph, if you're distantly related, the melting point of the hybrid DNA is going to be a lot lower than if you're closely related. Which was pretty cool 30 years ago. 30 years <laughs> ago, yeah. Now we're in the modern day. In fact, mm -hmm. that was more a historical note than more than anything else. Um, so now people do DNA sequencing. So you just clip out pieces of DNA and, and see the sequence of the nucleotide base pairs adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine. So you got your base pairs, ATCGs, uh, and they're lined up along the DNA, 
And so you can take different individuals. So those names down the left, those are, let's just say, individual mm -hmm. animals that you captured. And you think you have, uh, you know, are they all one species or two species or who's related to whom? Maybe these are, what is that, 15 different uh, critters out there. And notice the first line there, the first row, PB1. You know, it has a D, S, F, Y, R, S, M, R, W, L, T. Those are the actual um, alleles. Amino acids. Yeah, amino acids on uh, the DNA at those particular points that, that are labeled down the bottom, point one, point S, point F, point Y, point R. And, uh, and you can see Hebe 1, the first one on the line, and the next one, Ninja, whatever it is, uh, are pretty darn similar all the way across. Uh, you know, there's two or three differences. But otherwise, what you know, 86% similar, uh, and so then you can so you can compare all the possible pairs and see who's similar to who, and then you can come out with these trees uh, of showing relatedness, so like that. So A and B would be much more similar, 86% mm -hmm. similar than A and C, which are only 60% similar, and A and D are like only 30% similar. So the the sequence data is cool because it um, kind of operates the same way as comparing morphologies. So whether you're interested in does the bird have a flat keel or an extended keel, instead we're interested in whether it has an amino acid one or amino acid two. And so mm -hmm. there are only so many morphological variables you can look at, but um, the genetic code is so much longer and there's so much more information in it that you can have hundreds and hundreds of comparisons. Right. So here's a couple simple examples and that'll kind of be it. So if, <laughs> if we think about it, um, this might be one where just like take a piece of paper and uh -huh. write it out and see what you can do. If all species have trait X, does that really tell us anything in terms of their relatedness? Probably not, but the species that have why? Well, we only have two of those, and that's species A and species C. So if this is all the information we have to go on, we would expect that species A and C are more closely related to each other than species B. Than either of them mm. are to B. Right. So is that what this is? So this is um, a similar kind of example where we're looking at a phylogenetic tree, and if we only have one piece of information, so on our top row here, we have trait X, which might be a gene, it might be a morphology, whatever information we have to go on. And with that information, we know that species A, B, and C all have trait X, so that doesn't really tell us anything. But in this bottom row here, we add in trait Y, and we add in all the potential places that trait Y could have evolved. We also need to add that A and C share a trait that they don't share uh, with B. So on this first tree here we have trait X which is basal, it's in all three species, and then in our hypothetical example where we add trait Y to um, species A and C, we decided that Y evolves once here before we end up with species A and once here before we end up with species C. That's not a very parsimonious explanation. No, no, not at all. So we go through all four of our different potential trees and it turns out that there's only one tree here where trait Y evolves only once. So mm -hmm. how likely do you think it is for wings for example, to evolve twice right. versus to evolve once, and then all the and then all the relatives after that have have that trait. Right. That's much more. That's a much simpler explanation. Mm -hmm. So the parsimony still is a big deal, I guess, even with the genetic. Mm -hmm. Even with the. Genetic it's a good way to think about it. With mm -hmm. the genetic information, there's so many genes and so many changes out there that it's hard for us to wrap our heads around it. So there's a lot of backward computer work, back, mm -hmm. backward, behind the scenes mm -hmm. computer work, <laughs> backward. Yeah, the two main methods now, maximum likelihood and Bayesian, mm -hmm. are the ones used now. And even those are still just statistical tests, just models of what mm -hmm. could have happened given the data that you get, which is a chunk of DNA, usually. Mm -hmm.
So the last couple slides, you had a qu you had questions here. Mm -hmm. So are these, these are just some thought questions. Why are, what is Might this? be something to just leave you guys with to think over before we start lab. Mm -hmm. We can talk about it in lab. Uh, that was just kind of a cool tree of kind of the hypothesized relationship of birds to And then the real, other. real, real truth is here of kinds and of... And there's some of the information that kind of led us to this conclusion. So the ichthyoniformes and the neo neoornithes both have globe-shaped heads versus the neoorthines and the hespera or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That next one doesn't have a globe-shaped head, but mm -hmm. it does have this weird pelvic, pelvic structure. structure. So this is kind of just a, Pubis, a cool example to look at. Yeah. So it's kind of neat. Those last mm -hmm. three on the right have that backward-facing pubis. None of the ones on the left do. Mm -hmm. So that kind of wraps up our quickie there. Sounds what good. else? Why care about taxonomy? So it's, it's relationships are what we're kind of after here. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of... Um, taxonomy studies might seem kind of off in left field in terms of well, why do we need this genetic relatedness, what does this tell us, kind of big picture wise you can learn a lot from it. So not only are evolutionary relationships kind of cool just to figure out, we recently um, put the accipiter deformes closer, closely related to the parrots, which seems really counterintuitive, right? Mm -hmm. But um, based but, on genetic data, that's what's going on, which right, is kind of so, cool to think about. Yeah, it shows what can happen evolutionarily. Right. You know, it shows how right. much there change can you can get, changes. even though there's, they're closely related. Mm -hmm. And then there's, of course, the Wildlife Management issue the, of Endangered Species Act and, and that kind of thing. And you want to know whether something's distinct enough to, to um, deserve separate recognition and right. that kind of thing. So the blackback woodpecker just got recognized as a fairly distinct subspecies in the Black Hills of South awesome. Dakota, for example, without the DNA. So that's a group that we want to prioritize for right. conservation efforts right. because it is so different. But not only that, evolution doesn't stop. It continues and it's still going on and so understanding the past can actually help us understand the future. Cool. So we'll end with that. Mm -hmm.